Um, this is my first time to meet Craig. I know many other members of his family. As I said, he is uh, uh, Clay Ward, his brother-in-law. Clay's a pastor of uh, Play Roma Bible Church. And uh, what did I say? Did I say something wrong? Oh, you're just talking. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's right. Um, anyway, Craig is a graduate of the Indiana School of Law. He is got a chemical engineering degree, but he, spiritually he's gone over to Africa a number of times with uh, uh, clay, with uh, disciple makers uh, multiplied. He's been to Egypt, also India, uh, Myanmar, and, and other places. And so he has a long background in the word, but he is also uh, the DA in that area. So he is, um, came with high recommendations. So unlike who was that, Bruce this morning, who was talking about happiness is low expectations. So remember that. And uh, it's always good to have low expectations and be blown out of the water. So Craig, come and talk to us about why churches should be involved uh, politically and what their role is in government. Thank you, Pastor Dean, and I was out in the library praying and getting my thoughts in order before doing this presentation, but I, I did overhear Pastor Dean talking about me, and I will say what he was too polite to say. When you were looking at the list of speakers, you came upon this name and you said, who in the world is that idiot? <laughs> and I will now concur with uh, Dr. Baker and say that y'all are obviously intelligent and discerning people. Uh, I am in fact an idiot. No one was more surprised to see my name on the list than me, uh, but I am thankful for this opportunity to come and address you and hopefully we can delve into the subject of the local church's role in government to uh, our edification and put some practical use to our knowledge. I uh, hope at the end of this presentation that's what you will find. Just as a kind of a precursor leading into this, I was elected as district attorney for what's technically called the 14th Judicial District of the state of Tennessee in 2014. Uh, there are 31 elected DAs in the 95 counties in the state of Tennessee. So most districts have more than one county, but I'm blessed just to have Coffee County. I just have one county in my district, which makes things a whole lot easier uh, for me to handle. But uh, in eventually succumbing to the two-by-fours that the Lord kept putting me putting to the back of my head to get me to run for DA, I started evaluating this topic and started looking at what the Word of God says as it relates to Christians in government as a broader topic and uh, whether I needed to seriously consider running for elected office. One of my biggest hurdles to overcome is I grew up in that community and everyone knew me. Uh, so uh, that was a bit of a problem. Uh, I was blessed enough that everyone knew my parents and the rest of my family too, so that balanced things out a little bit. But um, I started looking at this and, and concluded that it was appropriate and necessary for Christians to take an active role. And I hope that the fruits of uh, those labors and looking into this will, uh, will be communicated today. And you will notice that I talk a little bit slower than Sharam. <laughs> I'm a little less witty than Dr. Baker. Uh, and I am not a scholar like Dr. Bollinger. And my paper does not exist. Uh, <laughs> so, what you're going to get here is a more simplistic uh, evaluation uh, by a fellow named Craig. Uh, but I hope that, that you will find it beneficial. But I do come at this a little bit different. I am 
I tell people I'm an attorney by profession and training and an engineer by personality. Um, I can say that since I do hold an engineering degree. Um, but I approach any time I'm going to teach, and in particular the Word of God, kind of the same way I approach a trial. In a criminal trial, I am tasked with uh, proving beyond a reasonable doubt certain elements of a crime. And to put it another way, I have to answer questions beyond a reasonable doubt. The statute sets out the things that I have to answer and prove to a jury in order to convict someone. So I do that. That's just the way my, my mind works. Is, and if I'm looking at a subject, I tend to formulate questions. And I've got this uh, fella. Let me get this to work that I have named Fred, who comes up in my presentations and asks me questions and kind of sets the parameter and framework of my presentation. In this situation, Fred only, came, he usually comes up with some pretty hard ones, but in this one, he came up with some pretty basic ones for me. And in the hour that we have, I hope that we'll answer them. The first one is, if we're gonna talk about the local church's role in government, we need to be on the same page as what we mean by government. So I am going to address what is government? What do we mean by government? And then the only other question that came up for me was the, was the ultimate question. What is the local church's role in government? So over the next hour or so, I hope that we will address those and come to an understanding on, on those. I do a silly thing. When I want a definition, I go to a thing called the dictionary. And... I went to the current edition of Merriam-Webster's Dictionary and looked to see how it defines government. And it defines it in three parts. First, it's the group of people who control, make a decision for a country, state, county, city, some political entity. It's the people who are given the authority to make those decisions and control those in the political entity. The second part of the definition is a system that is used for controlling a, a political entry, entity. And finally, the third part of the definition is the process or manner of controlling a country, state, county, city. So what does that mean to us? Well, it means those who you elect into office are part of government. It means that the system under which we operate is part of government. In the United States, that's a representative republic. So that is our system of government. And then it's the process in which those people implement the system. It's all three of those things put together. And I don't have any problem with that definition. I think that is an accurate uh, definition of government. The other thing that I tend to do when I want to figure out what something is, is turn to the Bible. So what is government from a biblical viewpoint? Well, government is a divine institution. And what does that mean? That means government was created by God. We often don't think of it that way. We can get confused and think government is a man-made system, a man-made process, but it's not. It is a divine institution created by God. How do we know that? Well, God tells us. It is recorded in Scripture. So let's go there now and look at when God created government. And that's in Genesis chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 1. And to get the context, this is after Noah and his family have been on the ark uh, and the waters are starting to recede and they come off the ark. Noah then, of course, sacrifices to God and we pick up in chapter 9, verse 1, and we read, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the, and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I, I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require it, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Now, verse 6, whoever shed, sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. 
For in the image of God he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly, and multiply in it. Where was government created in that? In verse 6. What happened in verse 6? God gave a law to man to follow. That law is respect the life of my image bearer. If you're going to have a law, you got to enforce it. If you're going to enforce it, you got to have a system in place to do so. you got to have a process by which the people then put that system into effect. That's our definition of government. Government was established by God at this time in human history. Which brings us to our next question. Why did God establish government at this time? Why now? Obviously, humans were created back in Eden. There wasn't government up until now. Why now? Well, that's a dispensational issue, isn't it? What's a dispensation? Dispensation are times in human history where God deals with folks, humans, his image bearers in different ways. When we transition from one dispensation, that is God transitioning in the way he deals uh, with his image bearers. Very simplistic definition. Uh, I'm not going to challenge my, uh, our colleague here who has spent a lifetime uh, studying it. He can probably give you a better definition than that, but that is Craig's simple definition of dispensation. So why now? Well, how, what was the first dispensation? The dispensation of, of innocence, or whatever you call it, but it's when before the fall when Adam and Eve were in the garden before the fall. Sin came into the world through Adam's sin, and God had to deal with his image bearers differently. And what did he do? Well, he said, well, now you're aware of the difference between good and evil. You have that wisdom that that the serpent tricked you into thinking you wanted. Now I'm going to have to deal with you differently. You conduct yourselves, do what I say is right, and not what I say is wrong, based upon your conscience, based upon what I have placed in you to know the difference between right and wrong. What happens? Complete depravity. Within a very short period of time, complete depravity. And that's what led to the worldwide flood, right? And that's what has just happened in this time in history. And and God now says, well, you've proven you can't do it through the divine institution of personal responsibility through volition. So I'm going to create a new divine institution called government. You're still going to act based upon your conscience, based upon the, the, uh, the inner sense of right and wrong that I have established in you, but you're going to do it as a collective. Now, we're going to do it. We're going to get other humans to help you do what's right. And he established government at that time for that purpose. So what can we deduce from that? What's government's role in humanity? What can we deduce by when he created government, what his purpose was? I think that is obvious as, as we talk through this. As established by God, if his divine institution is functioning correctly, government is intended to restrain evil and to promote righteousness. That is government's function in humanity. That is its purpose. That's why it exists. That's why God created this divine institution. Don't take my word for it. Scripture spells this out very clearly. Let's go to Romans chapter 13. And we're going to start verse 1 of Romans 13. Here we read, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So Paul starts out with God created government and put those in power who he wanted in power to run it. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. 
Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. So, Paul says, government is there when properly functioning to promote what God says is right and to avenge, to restrain what God says is wrong. Peter says the same thing in, a, in his own words. Let's look at that too, First Peter chapter 2, and see how, how Peter puts this. He, he spells it out even, even more clearly. 1 Peter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for punishment of evildoers, and the praise of, who, of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Peter says, be in subjection to both federal, the king, and local princes, governors, be, be in subjection to all levels of government. Why? Because they are sent for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of who do right. So government is to promote what's good and to condemn what's evil. Well, that should raise a question. How do we know the difference? What is righteousness and what is evil can only be measured by God's standard. That is the only absolute standard by which to measure right and wrong. And if government is to promote what's good and to condemn what's evil, then government better be governing on that standard or it's not functioning within the limits of the divine institution. <clears throat> God gives authority to government, and its authority is thus limited by God's mandates given in his word. In other words, God established government in order to promote what he says right is right and to condemn what he says is evil. If it is doing anything else, it is exceeding the authority given to it by God. It is violating the authority given to it. It is acting outside its realm. And we see an example of this in, in Scripture in Acts 4.18. Set this scene. Peter and John have been arrested for preaching the truth of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And the Jewish leaders are deciding what to do with them. And they summons them as we read in verse 18, before them. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. They threatened them and sent them on their way. Essentially what happens here is Peter and John say, Listen, y'all have told us to do something that God has clearly commanded us not to do, or vice versa, however you want to look at it. Y'all do what you want to us. We're going to do what God says. <laughs> that's, what he, that's what they said. Why? Because they had exceeded its authority. Government had see, ex exceeded its authority. You say, well, Craig, these are Jewish leaders. How's this government? The Roman government had delegated the authority of rule over the Jewish people to the Jewish leaders. So they are exercising governmental control over the Jewish people. Now I want to back up again to Romans 13. And Andy, you're to blame for this. I hold you responsible. <clears throat> you scared the dickens out of me. As I said, I was studying this subject uh, in, in anticipation or in contemplation of running for DA. Well, after I'd made the decision and those in Coffee County had, in some of you, made the mistake of electing me, um, I was continuing to study the subject. And I came, up, 
upon a series that Dr. Woods had done on this. And I don't know how I'd missed it. I'd read this passage uh, several times, but I'd missed it. It's, it's right there in front of you, uh, and it's, it's, I don't, I'm an idiot. I told you that before. I, I missed it. But let's read. Let's, let's start in, in Romans 13, verse 3, and read it again. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you, not, do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Why? For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. Why? For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the, on the one who practices evil. God calls those, calls government and those in ruling authority a minister of God. Now, in, all, in a certain respect, we're all ministers of God in all that we do because we're commanded to uphold his standard, right? We all fail, uh, but that is what we are to do as Christians. But Paul specifically calls out governmental leaders as ministers of God. Boy, <laughs> you're sitting in an elective office, that'll hit you like a ton of bricks. Uh, that is big. But it makes sense, doesn't it? What's a minister? What's a pastor teacher? What is, if he boiled it down to keep it simple, stupid Craig's level, uh, what is it? Well, it's to serve. But it's to promote, to teach God's standard, right? To teach us what is right in God's eyes and what is wrong in God's eyes. If that's government's role and you're serving in government, what does that make you? It makes you a minister of God. <laughs> that hit me hard. And, but it's the truth. Now, we all have a role in government in the United States, don't we? First and foremost, you're commanded to pray for all those in authority over you. That is a role in government that we serve as Christians. We also have a role in government in this great country because we go to the voting booth and we elect our leaders. We have a say in who rules over us. So we have a duty to be informed to know who we're voting for, to know what they stand for, to know who God has presented to us as options to serve, to be a minister unto him. We need to take that responsibility seriously. And in doing that, we need to evaluate who is seeking to serve. So I thought I'd come up with a list of some qualities that we should be looking for for those who are seeking office. And so we have a standard by which to judge them. So what are some of the qualities needed for a good ruler or political leader? One, you want someone that's quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. In other words, you want someone that'll sit down, shut up, and listen. If they can't do that, they can't properly lead. You want someone who puts aside wrongdoing. We're all imperfect. You want to prove that elected officials are imperfect? Follow me for 10 minutes. I'll prove it to you. I fail constantly. We're all imperfect, but we don't want to elect someone who is in a consistent lifestyle of sin, that are, is endeavoring to put aside wrongdoing in their lives and be led by the Spirit consistently. What does that mean? Be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. How many of you know those politicians who say they're, they're a Christian? Do we take that at face value? Well, I attend church. Yeah, you attend the biggest church that can get you the most votes, sit there on your phone, and don't ever think about the Word of God even while you're in church, much less after you leave. Is that who we want serving us? We want someone who's diligent, morally excellent, knowledgeable, self-controlled, godly, kind, and loving. Aren't those a list of, of folks that you want to rule over you, whether it's your boss, whether it's your political leader, uh, whether it's in marriage, whatever the relationship is, don't you want them to have these qualities? You want someone who's humble. 
You want someone who will recognize a mistake. You want someone who doesn't want a bunch of yes men around him just telling him what he wants to hear. You want someone who will take good Christian counsel. And when they recognize they made a mistake, admit it without qualification. Just admit it and then do what you can to fix it. Isn't that who you want to serve you? You want someone who's patient. Uh, That's a tough one, guys. You want ever to have people testing? Get elected to office. <clears throat> you, your patience will be tested, I promise you. Uh, but you need someone who's patient. That doesn't just fly off the handle, make a stupid decision in the heat of anger, uh, out of frustration. Uh, you need someone who is patient. He's someone who has foresight. You make, I speak from my own experience, hundreds if not thousands of decisions every day as a leader. Uh, whether they're personnel, whether they're, they uh, charge uh, someone with a crime, whether or not to, what offer to make. Uh, I go up and have to deal with legislative issues in Nashville. Uh, what laws do we promote? What laws do we oppose? How do we evaluate them? Do I get involved into a civil lawsuit? Wouldn't think about that as a DA, but it comes up. You need to be able to recognize the bigger consequences. If you don't have someone that can do that, they're not a leader. You need someone to be able to see what's coming down the road. What's this person's agenda that is pushing this? Why do they want it? It seems like such an innocent thing, but I know that where they generally stand. Why does this person want it? What what are they pushing? Well, what are the qualities you don't want? What do we need to avoid? Avoid someone who speaks without knowledge. Rattles on just to hear themselves talk. Doesn't know anything about anything, but that doesn't stop them from talking. (laughs) You don't want someone that's immoral, that lives in that consistent lifestyle of sin. Can you think of a group of people that that jumped to mind on that? How many of you thought of liars? (laughs) Adulterers. Don't want someone who follows current whims. Just take a poll. I'll do what they say because that'll get me reelected because that's what most, most people want right now. Take the poll on the same question tomorrow. And I, I don't know if y'all realize this, but those who give the polls manipulate them for their own agenda. You don't want someone who's arrogant. You don't want someone who will refuse good counsel. You don't want someone who wants to surround them with yes men. You don't want someone lover of money out for their own gain, their own greed, for what they get out of it. You don't want leaders that fit those qualities. Now, all man is depraved and naturally has the unwanted qualities. I hope this isn't a shock to you, but we all started in that default position with all those qualities. And to one extent or another, we still have some of all those qualities in us because we still are in the flesh. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5. Verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are the deeds of the flesh. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with griefs. What do those two passages have in common? Paul addressed believers. Yes, this is the default position for the sinner, but if we're not consistently taking in the word of God and applying it to our lives, that's where we default back to as believers. So again, do we just need to take it face value? Someone says, I'm a Christian. They might be, but does their lifestyle reflect it? Let's 
Okay. God set the parameters needed in a political leader. Now, we've seen some of it in the Word of God, but I want to go back to the first recording of what I think is the establishing of these parameters in Exodus. And again, to set the scene, this is Moses leading the Israelites and being overwhelmed. And his father-in-law, Jethro, comes to visit and sees what's going on. And let's pick up in verse 17 of Exodus 18. Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you are doing is not good. You will surely wear out, both yourself and these people who are with you. For the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You by the people's representative before God, and you, or you be the people's representative before God, and you bring their disputes to God. Then teach them the statutes and the laws and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they are to do. What is he counseling Moses to be? The spiritual leader. The local church in our day and age, right? To figure out what God wants, communicate it to others so they can then follow it. Furthermore, you shall elect out of the people able men who, one, fear God, Two, are men of the truth. Three, those who hate dishonest gain. And you should place these over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And if you keep reading, we see that Moses says, that's a good idea, Jethro. I'm going to do that. And he does. Presumably, he took it to the Lord before deciding to do so. It's not recorded here in Scripture. But I, we know God endorses it, don't we? Because this very system was set up in the Mosaic Law. It was endorsed and approved by God. So we have a list here that encompasses all those other qualities that we should look for in leader. They're in broader terms, and every other quality is a subset of these three broader things. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 8. Verse 14. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. Power is mine. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles rule and nobles all who judge rightly. What's talking about here is you, that, that they rule by wisdom. What is wisdom? An understanding and application of God's truth. That is how you justly govern and justly rule. So what's the ultimate conclusion on this? Only faithful Christians who are having their lives and thinking transformed consistently reflect the one qualities that we need and demand should demand in our leaders. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is, thought, which is your thoughtful service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For though the grace given, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each measure of faith. We are to, we are to look for men who are having their lives and thoughts transformed by the word of God to lead us, to govern us, to be ministers of God for us in their role of government. I listed a lot of other verses for the sake of time. I'm going to commend those to your own study, but essentially they say all those attributes of a good leader are developed through the fruit of the Spirit, through the power of Spirit working in our lives that only comes through the consistent application of God's truth in our lives. We also know that God blesses those who do justice and are righteous in every aspect of life, including those who rule in government. There's many passages that reflect this. I picked out two. Psalm 106.3. Verse 1. How blessed are those who keep justice, who practice righteousness at all times. If you want to bless country, get rulers who understand this. Micah 6.8. 
a little out of context. It deals directly with Israel, but I think there's indirect application uh, in our lives and in, as we look at our government. And frankly, it's just one of my favorite verses in Scripture, so I find every excuse to go to it. <laughs> but in Micah 6, 8, we read, He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Boy, if we had leaders that did that. Boy, if we did that in our own personal lives, how much better would we serve God? And we must remember that God establishes governments and places the rulers in power. He's in control. God is in control. <clears throat> We're told that in Colossians chapter 1. Starting in verse 16. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Rulers and authorities are created for him. So, what does this mean? That we must not forget that we ultimately are placing our faith in God and not man or government. God uses government and the men who he places in ruling positions to bring blessings to the country and its citizens, if it and they are faithful to him. We are not trusting man. We are not trusting government. We are trusting God who is in control of those things. Don't get confused. But that does not abrogate our responsibility to fulfill our roles in government, whatever those are. Let's go back to Psalms. Go to Psalm 22. You didn't know an attorney would make you flip through your Bible like this, did you? <laughs> Psalm 22, verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. God rules over the nations, plural. Psalm 118. Verse 8, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. We place our faith in God. So if we see bad rulers in our country, that's called grace before suffering most of the time. He is trying to get our attention, to wake up, see where we have failed, giving us a chance to take corrective action. He has put them there for a reason. Well, Fred's back, and he's confused. <laughs> Y'all, you're supposed to be talking about the local church's role in government, Craig. I haven't heard a word about it yet. Well, I hope with this foundation, the answer to that question is evident. Local church's role should be clear. It is responsible for training men to properly function as leaders of a community, state, and country. It's the foundation. It is what prepares men to serve as ministers of God in their function in government. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up the body of Christ. Equipping the saints for work of service. We're told by Paul in Romans that part of that work of service is being a minister of God in the function of government. But don't miss the other point here. Does it say he just gave us pastors for the equipping of the saints? No. All of our spiritual gifts are to come together and work as one to build up each other. It is not just the pastor's job. That is the function of the local body, to bring us all together. So whether you have the gift of pastor-teacher, the gift of evangelism, the gift of helps, the gift of giving, the gift of leadership, whatever the gift is that God the Holy Spirit gave you at the time of your salvation, they work together as a unit. And that happens in the local church when we come together as a local body. Iron, iron sharpening iron. 
building each other up, bearing one another's burdens. That is what happens in the local church. And that is how we equip the saints to go out into the world and deal with that mess. So, only by consistent intake and application of all of God's truth can a leader properly function in the role given to him by God. The foundation of it is God's truth, his word. The pastor has an important role. As the pastor goes, often the church goes, because he is in a position of leadership, in a position of authority, but it's not his sole responsibility. We all have a job to do. The leader's role is to promote righteousness, which comes from the application of God's word and his deeds and the laws he promotes and opposes. <clears throat> that means the entire counsel of Scripture. To 2 Timothy 3. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. If you're a minister of God, is that a good work? So is functioning in government a good work in God's eyes? How do we get equipped for that? Our founding fathers got it. Don't be fooled. When you see me up here taking a deep breath, clenching my jaw, it's me trying to resist the temptation of talking about the lie that has fed us of separation of church and state. I probably won't resist it completely, but I'll do my best. George Washington said, It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and to humbly to implore his protection and favor. Our first president, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, Religion and morality are indispensable. What is he talking about when he said religion and morality? Is he talking about Islam? He's talking about Christianity and only Christianity. It is indispensable for political prosperity. John Adams, our first vice president, second president, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in, in, in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. And they're trying to tell us that Christians need to stay out of government, that the Christian standard needs to stay out of government, that the founding fathers mandated separation of... Oh, I'm not resisting. Um, <laughs> don't believe the lie. <laughs> I could do an hour or more just on that, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't need to get sidetracked. Uh, Adams also said, our Constitution is, was made for only for a moral religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. It can't, no government, but especially our government, can't function properly if we divorce it from Christianity, if we divorce it from God's truth. And what is government again? The system, the process, and the people, all three of them, can't divorce any part of government from the truth. John Jay, our first Supreme Court Chief Justice. I love this one. Providence has given our people the choice of their rulers. It is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. You think he would have penned that, uh, that law about separation of church and state? But no, our duty to elect God-fearing Christians. Now, when we think of founding fathers, we often just think of the country, the founding fathers of our country. But every one of our states had founding fathers as well. And originally, I haven't researched this out enough, but I believe at least, if not more, at least the first 31 states in the Union had what is referred to as a religious test for holding 
constitutionally elected public offices contained in their state constitutions. And essentially it says you have to hold certain beliefs in order to serve in a constitutionally elected position in this state. Now, there are eight states who still have them in their constitutions. And I've listed those states here in this slide. I'm kind of partial to one, Tennessee. Um, tend to know it better since that's where I'm from. All my Texas friends here, I'm sure you're partial to the volunteers and helping you out of that little scrape a few years ago. Uh, so probably would appreciate looking at that constitution and, and getting a better understanding. The founders of the state of Tennessee recognized that only Christians could adequately understand and implement the purpose of all government offices. What was originally Article 8, but is now Article 9 of the Tennessee Constitution, reflects this and who is eligible to hold office in Tennessee. And I, I can't stress this enough. It is still in our Constitution. It is still there today. So let's read it. Article 9 of the Tennessee Constitution deals with who is disqualified from holding elected, constitutionally created offices in Tennessee. Section 1 reads, whereas ministers of the gospel are by their profession dedicated to God and the care of souls and ought not to be diverted from the great duties of their functions, therefore no minister of the gospel or priest of any denomination whatever shall be eligible to, to a seat in either house of the legislature. So what does that mean? That means that Christian ministers, Christian pastors cannot serve in the Tennessee State House or Senate. Craig, that sounds like separation of church and state to me. Uh, well, what's going on here? Well, let's read the next section. No person who denies the being of God or a future state of rewards and punishment shall hold any office in the civil department of this state. What God are we talking about? Look at section one. The God of the gospel, the God of scripture, the only one true God that is revealed to us in his creation and in the Bible. That is the God they were talking about. So what are they saying here? They're saying, pastors, you've got a more important job than coming up here and legislating. Stay home, equip those to come up here and serve. You teach them the truth. You teach them the standard, and you send them up here. Get them ready. Don't waste your time on this. They got it. They understood that is still in our Constitution today. Hopefully, one of those crazy groups that don't like religion doesn't figure it out because we'll probably be facing a lawsuit to remove it. Accurate understanding and application of God's truth is fundamental to all divine institutions. So a few concluding thoughts here. Divine institutions are those things that God has created. And when I talk about five, or talk about divine institutions, I'm really thinking of five things. Volition, marriage, family, government, and nationalism. Those are the five divine institutions that I'm thinking about here. And if they're created by God, for God, they have to be based upon his truth. If they're not, they don't function correctly. They are perverted and misused. As such, in this dispensation, the local church is the foundation for the proper establishment and implementation of all governments. Why? It's a divine institution, and the local church is God's mechanism by which to communicate and build up and equip the saints for this dispensation. If the church fails, government fails. And actually, let's walk through this. I think what you will see is if the church fails, all five divine institutions fail, and probably in the order that I just gave them. The church fails, what goes first? Personal responsibility, the first divine institution. No one's at fault for anything. It's not my fault, but if it is, it wasn't really my fault. <laughs> that goes first. What goes next? Marriage. Because you have no accountability inside your marriage, marriage collapse. What collapses next? Family. What collapses next? Government. 
What collapses next? The entire nation. They're like dominoes. Therefore, it is vital for the local church to consistently and accurately teach the entirety of God's truth for the leaders of this country to be properly trained. If there are no faithful Christians, there's no one out there to elect and to hold these offices. And let me take a personal side here, too. From my personal experience, it is not enough just to get faithful men into office. That's great. We need to do that. But why do you want those faithful men in there? Well, we agree that there's a lot of unfaithful men in office right now. And guess what? When you get a faithful man into office and he takes principled stands, guess who's going to be upset? All those unfaithful men. And guess who they've got in their back pocket? The media. All the most vocal enemies of Christ are in their back pocket. So what happens? The faithful man gets attacked from all sides. Everything's misconstrued, give you half the information. I don't know if you realize this, but the media twists things and have an agenda that they want to promote. And then you start assessing that guy that you got into office and say, well, I didn't put him in office to do that. Go talk to him, especially on the local level. Go talk to him. I bet there's information you don't know. And if there's not, and he needs, needs to take corrective action, someone's got to tell him. My door's always open. I guarantee you, especially on the local level, Everyone who is a faithful man will have his door open to you and will address any concerns that you have. He better have a basis upon which he made a decision that fits Scripture. You get attacked. So you need to pray for him after you get them elected. You need to encourage them when you see them out at the soccer game, at Walmart, wherever you run into them. Encourage them. Ask questions. Make sure they're remaining faithful. When you're evaluating those that you put into place, you better evaluate more deeply than what they're giving to you on the surface. Only principal leaders can guide a nation into responsible action and enable others to understand and appreciate those principal decisions and actions and policies. Part of my duty as an elected official is to use opportunities that are given to me to try to communicate why I made the decision that I did. But y'all have to be equipped, too, to understand what I'm saying, right? So y'all have to be in the local body and learning and functioning in your role as government, as the electorate, and as the one who is holding up that elected official in prayer. Here's an important point. Government will be used to promote someone's standard. If Christians abandon the responsibility, there are plenty of others ready and willing to take their place. Whether it be atheism, humanism, Muslims fit into our theme this week. You think they're chomping at the bit to take over our government? If we step out and say, you know, God, I know you created that divine institution, but it's kind of dirty and messy and no fun. I don't want any part of it. We turn it over to the enemy. Not everyone is called to be an elected official, but some of you are. And I can tell you, it's scary. Uh, I resisted. I did. I, uh, it, <laughs> I literally, there was, I picked up papers to run two weeks before the deadline. I resisted to the end. And then I, I, I don't know that I've ever admitted this before, so Clay stopped listening. Um, <laughs> But I think part of, let's just say I didn't run a conventional campaign. I actually told people what I thought. Um, didn't uh, actually do a whole lot to raise money. Uh, and part of that may have still been a holdover from, um, holdover from my resistance. Now, the telling of what I think. If you know my mom, you know that's naturally ingrained in me, and then um, uh, it's also part of just standing for the truth, and that's just, I think, as faithful people, principled people, 
telling the truth is what we're called to do, whether people like it or not. Where I fail is I don't always do it patiently and in love. Uh, I can, uh, I can, <laughs> I can uh, improve in that area. But one last point, and to end on a little bit more positive of a note. In the end, we must remember that only through Christ are we truly free. Galatians 5.1 It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Christ, through his work on the cross, bearing the sins for us, the taking the penalty that was due us onto him who did not deserve it. He died in our place. He was buried and resurrected three days later. By simply believing those historical facts, we have salvation. We have salvation from the penalty of sin that is due us. During this life, if we walk by the Spirit, we have salvation from this, the sin's right to rule over us. And then ultimately, we have salvation from the very presence of sin as we're home with the Lord. What a wonderful thing to think of. Don't trust government. Trust God. With that, remembering that I'm an idiot and I'm the only thing that stands between you and dinner. <laughs> Are there any questions? We'll start here and work backwards. Just perhaps as a hypothetical, let's say the federal government does something ridiculous like legalize gay marriage. And you're a Christian county clerk working in a marriage license <laughs> office. And uh, this is all hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And you refuse, you refuse to follow the federal law and the a matter gets brought to the district attorney, whoever that might be. And uh, how, as Christians, would you deal, do you think we should deal with all those situations? Well, let me start. I, I will have to agree, disagree slightly. Uh, I guess it was at lunch. Uh, there was a comment made that nine people in a black robe now rule us. That's a little inaccurate. Five people in black dresses rule us. It just takes five votes. It doesn't take all nine. And when they uh, legislated policy, and, I, and that's what they did. If you ever read their opinion, they don't base it on the Constitution. They don't base it upon law. They don't base it on anything. They start in the very first paragraph saying, we think it's a better policy for homosexual marriage to be legitimized. Therefore, we're going to rule this way. That's what they say at the very beginning. But here's, I'll answer your question in, in, in two ways. One, specifically addressing the situation that you arose, and, and two, giving you a, an example of what I face. Uh, as to the clerk, it just boils down to, are you going to do what God says, or are you going to do what man says? And the clerk will probably lose their job either immediately or through election, if they take a stand on God's truth. We are not saved from the consequences of standing on the truth. And I think you just have to make a decision any time you hold office that you're going to stand on the truth and what consequences come, come. And that would be my advice to the clerk, is don't, um, don't succumb. As far as the DA prosecuting, that kind of leads me into my second part of the answer. DAs have what's called prosecutorial discretion. Y'all need to know who your DA is. Y'all give us a lot of authority, whether you know it or not. You give us a lot of authority. We can choose to prosecute anything, but we can choose not to prosecute anything up to and including murder. Uh, it's our choice, unfettered. Uh, so you better know who your DA is. 
So to deal with that, you elect a good Christian man as DA, and that will be uh, make sure that they at least don't get prosecuted criminally. That decision had a lot bigger ramifications than a lot of people know. It had ramifications on my professional life. You say, well, Craig, you deal with crimes. How can homosexual marriage deal with criminal aspect? Y'all know what assault is? Guy gets drunk in a bar, punches someone in the nose, usually over a woman. That's an assault. There's a subcategory of assault called domestic assault. And it carries the same punishment in Tennessee. It's a misdemeanor, class A misdemeanor, punishable by up to 11 months, 29 days in jail. But a domestic assault carries more punishment. You forever lose the right to own a gun under federal and state law. Uh, you have restrictions on your movement that you wouldn't otherwise have under just a, what we call simple assault. And there are other enhanced punishments. So the social engineers on the Supreme Court decided that we now have homosexual marriage. I disagree with them. What do I do with domestic assaults? On one hand, I don't prosecute them because I don't recognize that it's marriage. On the other hand, if I don't prosecute them, then the sinner, the immoral guy, gets less punishment. What do you do? Well, the reason where I came down in my evaluation was the reason that there's enhanced punishment on a domestic violence is to recognize and protect the sanctity of marriage. And I said there's no marriage to protect. So I don't prosecute them as domestics. And that is one of many decisions like that that you face um, that you just wouldn't see. And the point is you need someone who, and I'm uh, not holding myself up as the gold standard. I just, an example of my life, I, I certainly fail. Uh, but you need someone who will do an evaluation on those terms and making those decisions. If your specific situation came to me, I'd pat her on the back, give her a hug, say, go at it. Um, I wouldn't be prosecuting. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we had one, one more over here. Would you advocate? I'm still not coming on. <laughs> would you advocate um, churches, say, like having informational meetings? I'm not talking about during worship service or during Sunday school regular worship times, but other times. Uh, earlier in the earlier session, uh, Sharam addressed um, Vatula Galen and the the uh, charter schools, Harmony schools. Uh, there's a lot of people that either are innocently ignorant or else they deny this kind of thing. Uh, you know, like a, a program um, that people can come to, you know, would a church actively do something like that? Or are you talking strictly about <coughs> studying the Bible? If I'm understanding your question, uh, you're asking me if... I would advocate for churches to help educate those in their church yes. on the stances of different political right. nominees. Well, not necessarily even <laughs> nominees, but political uh, agendas, I'd say, agendas. Or um, well, I'll come at it from two points of view, um, or two separate s subjects. One, as far as, like we're in an election cycle now, as far as uh, educating those about who's running, uh, and this is uh, a legal disclaimer, I can't help it, I'm an attorney. Uh, this is Craig talking. Uh, this is not Schaefer or Plain Roma Church or, or West Houston Bible Church. This is Craig's opinion. Uh, I think that knowing who your political leaders are is a form of worship. If you are going to elect ministers of God I think it's up to the church to make sure that those in their congregation are informed on that decision. Um, so I have absolutely no problem with the church doing that. How they do that, whether it's part of their main 
study or a separate time where they invite folks to come and have those discussions, uh, that would be an individual local body's decision on how to approach that. But for my evaluation, I think that would be important. Um, as far as different agendas being pushed in the community, uh, yes, I think that's also part of the local church's role, and that can be formally and informally. But I certainly think there's many ways, when you're just studying through Scripture, you come across a principle that has direct application in your community, and I think it's incumbent upon the leaders of that church to make sure that those in their church are aware of those issues and are seeing how to evaluate those issues through Scripture. Uh, so, yes, I would advocate for both those things. Um, in Acts chapter 16, uh, after Paul is um, vindicated and the local authorities in Philippi decide, gee, we better get him back out of thing because we didn't realize he was a Roman citizen. I, don't you think that that section where Paul resists and embarrasses the local government by staying in jail and saying, I'm not leaving the jail until they come down and let me out to make it a public issue because he was a Roman and that was Roman rights. And in the present time, we've got the First and Second Amendment type deals. Um, do you see that that might be an educational passage for holding to our federal rights when they're violated, as Paul did his? Because the whole of Acts, Luke Acts, seems to be very friendly to the Roman government. I, I definitely think, yes, that that is something that we can use in our studies to uh, evaluate when we need to resist. I think going... Uh, quietly into the night is not usually the right idea. Uh, and if you have the opportunity, uh, bringing a focus onto it uh, is, is needed. Uh, how are we going to galvanize our churches across the nation and come together as, a, as the body of Christ and working through the same issues together and united if we aren't aware that anyone else is going through it? Uh, so yes, and I, I haven't thought this through, so this is me just thinking out loud, but certainly God gifts different people uh, with different attributes and different strengths, and there are some uh, who are going to be better equipped for what comes from taking that stand public firm than other, or public uh, firm stand than others, and I think you have to be honest with yourself if you're spiritually equipped to do that. Uh, there will be attacks. I hear all the time military people, thank you for your service, thank you for service. How many political officials, as an elected official, I want to thank you personally for your service to your county, to your state, and to this country. Thank you. Is there ever a case um, where you would not pursue the death penalty for first-degree murder? Short answer is yes. Um, I've got two things that I have to evaluate in uh, death penalty cases, primarily, and in, in whether I would seek it. Um, first is does God's standard call for it? And most often when you're talking first degree murder, just so we're on the same page, we're talking about a premeditated killing of an image bearer. Um, so if we're talking first degree murder, it meets God's standard uh, for death penalty. However, uh, man's law does not, is not so inclusive. Uh, there are uh, what are called aggravating factors that I have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, to a jury in order for them to have the option to impose the death penalty. And I can't justify filing if I know I don't have those aggravators. Um, especially heinous is one, so that it will, that's a broad enough term where it can capture a lot of, of cases. Um, uh, multiple victims, um, uh, 
to a certain extent, criminal history. Uh, there are a lot, there are, I think there are nine aggravated factors in Tennessee law that, that I have to prove at least one of them, and I have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it outweighs a litany of uh, mitigating uh, factors that the defense gets to put on. Um, so it is a struggle. Uh, it is something that I am still praying on and sorting through in my own mind. But where I am right now is I've agreed to uphold our laws and be good stewards of the money uh, that it takes. If I know that I can't, under the law, get the conviction I, or get the death penalty, I, I just believe that it's my duty not to seek it. Um, but it's, it's tough. And the other factor, just from a practical standpoint, and I'm, I'm on the legislative committee, the Tennessee District Attorney Generals in Tennessee have a statewide conference. Um, of course, I'm part of that as being an elected DA. They've put me on the legislative committee, and I am the chair of the subcommittee for capital punishment. So this is something that I have given a lot of thought to. Um, the big argument for no longer having the death penalty is that it is so ineffective. We um, I believe it's Ecclesiastes 8.11 that says uh, uh, that a man will harden his heart if there's not speedy justice. And we are so far away from that in the death penalty that the first thing we need to do is start enforcing it in a timely manner. And the last person in my county that was sentenced to death, stayed on death row for 30 years before he died of natural causes. Um, so it's frustrating. And victims' families come to you and want closure from all the appeals, don't want to have that wound keep opened up um, at all these different hearings. And that's something else that I, just from a humanity standpoint, take into consideration on what I do. So Craig, I have, a, I have a question. Excuse me, I have a question. I've heard that it costs more money to execute somebody than to keep them on death row until they die of natural causes. I, I logic tells you that that's got to be a lie. Um, as if you're going through all the things you're going through for trial, for uh, sentencing, for appeals, for housing them, for everything else, and if you short, shorten their life by 20 years, it's got to be less expensive. Well, it seems that way, but you know, if, they're, if, if, the, if, the, if yeah, it seems that way, but the argument would be on death row, you know, they're going to be appealing and appealing that and appealing that, and that's what, all those legal fields is what piles I, up, I guess. I haven't studied those numbers, but I, I'm just very skeptical. There's an agenda behind well, I mean, if they, if they did it speedily, but like you just pointed out, you got a guy on oh, death yeah. row. It's, the you, way it's practiced is with all of the appeals, keeping them on death row, they live for another 20, 30 years yeah. instead of 40. It, yeah, you, that would be why they, they, you're right. they would say that. You're right. As it, as it practically exists now, it definitely is more expensive. If it was implemented quickly and correctly, then right. we'd save money in the long run. But, yeah. Uh, the, okay, this will be our last question over here. I was just wondering, uh, based on the hypothetical that we started with, uh, if you'd be in favor of the states, counties not issuing marriage licenses anymore. I, I, don't, I don't think marriage is a government function, uh, personally. I think it's a union between man and, and, and woman and God. Uh, that, that's where the contract exists. Um, so... From just that pure biblical evaluation, I think government should get out of the business. Uh, the practical side of it, though, is we have so many laws that implicate marriage that I don't know how you do it without having some type of governmental licensing to know who's married and who's not. Um, on one hand, I could argue that we need to do away with those laws, but on the other hand, I think it's good to promote marriage. And uh, if if government's going to 
uh, promote God's standard, and one of his divine institution is marriage, and we should promote and endorse it. So uh, there's no easy answer to that. Um, I don't know. I don't think Clay would mind for our church. Uh, uh, we have gotten out of the business of doing marriages for the government. We'll stu- still do, do marriages before God, but we don't, don't sign off on the marriage certificate. Now that's the same policy we have. I have a question for you. Have you studied the history of marriage licensing by the government? I have not. I did a what may be a superficial study of this a couple of years ago. It's been three or four hours. And apparently the first national law, a Uniformity of Marriage Act, was passed by the National Congress in, anybody know? Anybody want to guess? 1923. Okay, so my question is, before that, what were they doing that? Well, they, they, they licensing started in the late 1800s. Anybody know why? To prevent racial, interracial marriage. Okay, to prevent interracial marriage. So the origin was racist, right? Okay, so that's why it came in. And then what was discovered? It's a good source of revenue. <laughs> ah, well, they may have done it over here for racist reasons, but we're just doing it because we get more money. And before, but before all of that, how did you know you were married? How did you make it legal? You went to the pastor because you had a homogenous society that was about 95, 98% Christian in some way, shape, or form, or another, or Jewish. They came out of a Judeo-Christian heritage, so they'd go to their rabbi or their pastor uh, uh, or the, the local church, and they would get married, and it would go into the records of the church. And then if you got, I don't, but I don't know how they got divorced. But the divorce rate wasn't that high, or they would do what, uh, in, in my shady background, uh, my true biological grandfather just disappeared, and he was, <laughs> and he was declared dead seven years later. So, <laughs> and that was before 1923, or my dad was born in 1923, so it was right after that. So I don't know how they, but it was in Arkansas. So <laughs> <laughs> now my now my dirty secrets are out. <laughs> All right. Well, Craig, thank you very much. That was an outstanding job. Appreciate it. Thank you a lot.